of you, to the left or right, uh, grab that, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, uh, towards the end of the New Testament. Hebrews 11, uh, we call this the Hall of Faith or the Faith chapter. And if you remember a couple weeks ago, I I said that there's a danger in studying uh, these characters, these people of Hebrews 11, because there's the danger of elevating them to the place of like a Marvel hero or DC comic hero, supernatural, that somehow that they're different than you and I, that their faith somehow was endowed by God in a special way. But we need to remember that these are ordinary people with an extraordinary faith. They're ordinary people with an extraordinary faith, that they chose to develop a faith in God by having a daily relationship with Him. Sometimes that relationship lasted years, and some of them it lasted decades, maybe even millennia. That they did not, again, just grow old in their faith, they grew up in their faith. And it's a challenge to us. In fact, we use these characters Again, not to worship, but to be an example for you and I, to look at their lives, to examine what they did, and then take that and contrast that with our faith and say, how am I doing? How's my faith in God? Is my faith a weak faith or is it strong? And if you remember, I'd asked this, these couple questions that if our faith is weak or shallow, these two questions we need to all answer. Number one is whose fault is it? And number two is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to change that weak or that shallow faith? See, it is a choice that we make. We make it every single day we live to walk by faith or walk by just what we want to do by sight. And so today, we're going to be studying about the man called Abraham. Now, you know Abraham. He had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. And some of you now are going to sing that in your, song, in your head the rest of the day, and you're welcome for that. Uh, but Abraham's story is found in Genesis chapter 11, verses, uh, or <laughs> Genesis chapters uh, 11 through 25. He is the father of the Hebrew people, the father of the Israelite nation. Uh, he was, again, a, a man that was a descendant from Shem, one of Noah's sons. I guess we're all descendants from Noah's sons, right? And again, read about his story in Genesis 11 through 25. So Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham, lived in an area called the Ur, Ur of Chaldees. All right, some people say the Ch, the Ur of Chaldees. Now, we're not exactly sure where Ur is, <laughs> uh, but we do know this. We know that Ur means land, and so in a sense, Ur of the Chaldeans means that it was the land where the Chaldeans lived. Okay, does that make sense? And so it might not have been a city specifically, but it might have been just a region or an area where these people had congregated. Now, what we do at least kind of presume is that it's probably in what is currently today southern Iraq. It is north of the Persian Sea, and it's in what they call the Fertile Crescent. What we do know about Ur is this. We know that it was a place of great commerce. We know that it, whether it was a city or maybe uh, it was like Decapolis where there was 10 cities and it was all together, but this was a metropolis. This was a growing place. This was a place of wealth. It was a place of luxuries. It was a place where people wanted to go. In fact, Ur was a destination city. People moved to Ur. They did not move from Ur, okay? They moved to Ur. They did not move from her Ur. Abraham, of course, was also married. His wife's name was Sarai. Eventually, her name also was changed by God to Sarah. And there they had their friends. And into that kind of storyline, we read this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, where it says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went. And listen to this caveat here, even though he did not know where he was going. All right, now I want you to note this important thing. Uh, People moved to Ur, they didn't move away from Ur. Can you imagine the looks and the comments that Abraham got when he told his other family members and friends that they were moving away? I I will tell you that that was an unusual thing. And so one of the very first things we learn about Abraham's faith was he was willing to leave what was familiar. He left the familiar. All right, say yes if you like to go on, not yet, say yes. Well, I did say yes, didn't I say? Say yes if you like to go on a trip. 
Okay. How many of you say yes if you like to come home from a trip? Okay. All right. How many of you would say, you've either got to pick the word home or trip. Which do you like better, going on the trip or coming home? Say one of those two words. Ah, okay. About half and half. All right. Kim and I got to go up to Illinois earlier in June, got to see my parents, my sisters, some family members. We enjoyed it. We got to see uh, our son, Jonathan, and his wife, Sarah, and our granddaughter, Anne, just a few weeks ago up in Tennessee, and we loved it. It was great spending time with our family. But both of us commented as we are coming home, oh, it's good to be home. It's really nice to sleep in our own bed, have our own shower, you know, be around the things that we're comfortable with us. I will tell you that home is... Is where you're most comfortable. Home, home is familiar. Home is easier because almost every single one of us probably have a routine that we live by and we go through when we're home. When we're traveling, and I don't care if it is your closest family member or one of your bestest friends in the entire world, when you're staying at their house, you're still a stranger, all right? It's still, you still feel a little bit out of place because it's not your home. I think Dorothy said it well when she said there's no place like home. All right, pretty, pretty good analogy. And so Abraham here, he was no different than any of us. He grew up in this region, this city, this town, this, this land mass, this area. Everyone he knew was there. I imagine that maybe his barber was the same guy that cut his dad's hair and that cut his grandpa's hair. He probably had his favorite restaurants, all right? He probably went to the Agora, the marketplace, and saw his friends and other family members, maybe even on a daily basis. Abraham was comfortable where he was at. And I believe at times being comfortable is not always a very good thing for us. You see, we can get very comfortable with a bad habit that we accept in our life. Or we can get comfortable with an an addiction. Or we can become comfortable living in this cocoon where we just shelter ourselves from everyone else and just live in this little hermetically sealed bubble, we can get very comfortable spending time only with our Christian friends, those of like precious faith. Sometimes we can get comfortable with a lackluster faith. It's dangerous at times to get comfortable. Again, that was definitely not Abraham, for he was willing to step out and act upon his faith. But I would wonder sometime, do you and I get too comfortable? Do we get too comfortable with the things that are around us that don't please God? What is it that you need to leave in order to have a more extraordinary faith? Maybe what you need to leave, again, to have that extraordinary faith is something that's going on in your life that you know does not please God. Maybe you need to leave a pattern of life, a certain thing that has become so familiar, but you know it's not out, it's outside of God's will. Maybe, you're, maybe what you need to leave is your house because there are friends and neighbors and acquaintances that you know that you've built in a relationship who need to know Jesus and you need, need to get off your butt and get out of the house and talk to those people about what Jesus has meant to you. Maybe you need to leave your routine. Don't shake your head yes or acknowledge this, but maybe you have a routine of watching television four, five, six hours a day. And maybe that routine needs to be stopped. And you need to put in place Bible reading, prayer, talking to the Lord, singing His praise. Maybe you need to leave a grudge behind. A grudge that you have held on to and you have nursed and you have rehearsed in your mind over and over and over again. And it's not doing you or anyone else any good. Maybe the thing you need to leave is a relationship. A relationship that you know is not godly and moral and right, and that relationship needs to end in order to please God. I think that we can get comfortable. We can get comfortable with things that, again, have no business in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ. You know what? When we begin to loosen our grip on all these things we're comfortable, and when we step out in faith, guided by, of course, the Holy Spirit, we can find a set of experiences and joys and challenges that can take us to new heights in our faith if we'll just get out of the comfort zone that we're seeking to live by. Now, <clears throat> don't, uh, don't, don't, don't try to change everything at one time. 
I, I know people that try to make that 180 change, and sometimes that is a little bit overwhelming. They get overwhelmed. They, they bite off more than they can chew. I would say make incremental changes where you step out in faith and you trust God to do something, and then the next day you try a little bit more. But take it in bite-sized pieces so that God can be honored in all things. Again, I want to go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, where it says, Abraham, when he was called to go, he went. Now, I want you to think about it. That was what Abraham was called to do. He had a very specific, God said, hey, here's what I want you to do. Here's where I want you to go. Although I'm not really going to tell you where you're going to go, but I want you to go. And Abraham said, okay, I'm going to do that. The question is, what are you and I as New Testament Christians, what are we called to do? Or, or maybe more specifically, what are we called to be? Well, there's a lot of things in the New Testament. Let me give you some of these. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, we are called to be children of God. In other words, we're not, we're not supposed to be connected to this world. We're not to be children of the world who conform themselves to the patterns of this world. Instead, our speech, our conduct, our emotional responses, our thought process, all should not mirror the world, but should mirror instead our Heavenly Father. We are also called to do another thing. Now, most of us know the great promise that's found in Romans 8, 28, that God can work all things together for good. I'm sorry, God will work all things together for good. But did you notice in that there is a bilateral covenant? It's a conditional statement. It says, if you love him and when you are called according to his purpose. When you're called according to his purpose. So the question is, what is God's purpose? What is his goal? Well, Jesus summed up it all and said, I came to seek and save the lost. And Jesus said, to draw all men unto myself. Yeah, I would say that that probably should be our goal too, right? I mean, we have a lot of goals, a lot of purposes in our lives. And, and maybe all of these things, you, see, you can relate to some of them. To raise a family or to help raise grandchildren or to stay healthy or to be a good neighbor or, or to have a good relationship or, or to be debt-free or maybe just to have a good life. And none of these purposes is really a bad, negative, evil purpose. But it can't be your highest purpose because if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, a Christian, then your purpose should coexist and line up with God's purpose, and that is bringing people to Jesus, part of our vision statement. Romans chapter 1, verse 7 gives us another thing we're called to. We're called to be holy people, holy like God is holy. And I know that's a pretty high standard because holiness means perfection. And probably all of us would admit, eh, not there yet, still got a ways to go. But we're working on it, and hopefully today is better than yesterday, and tomorrow will be better than today. Here's another thing we're called to. We're called in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, we're called to live in the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace, unmerited favor. We're not living under the yoke of the law any longer. We're freed from that and from the fear of the law. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 says we are called to be free. Again, we're no longer under the Old Testament law. Colossians chapter 3, verse 15 says we are called to peace. We talked about a few weeks ago how when we have a peace with God, it leads to internal peace, and that can lead to me to, to be more peaceful with others, to be more of a peacemaker to the people around me. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says we are called out of darkness. Scripture always equates darkness with sin and light with holiness. We're called out of sinfulness, and we're called to live a life that honors and mimics our Lord and Savior Jesus. And listen to this one in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. We are called to eternal life. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? We're called to eternal life. That is the promise for those of us who are not only called by God, but who answer the call. Not only who are called, but who answer the call. The call, And as just as Abraham did what God asked, went where God wanted him to go, and thus he received the inheritance of the promised land, you and I too have a promised land that we are given. Of course, we call that eternity, heaven, everlasting life. Now, we do find another calling in the book of Revelation. It's kind of not the calling we want to live up to. It's found in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16. It says, they, and the they refers to the people who reject Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord into their life. 
They are calling out to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. You catch that? Little lamb, Mary had a... I mean, a little sweet lamb, but would they want to be saved from the wrath of the lamb because this refers, of course, to judgment. This refers to judgment. See, every single person is going to call out to God at some point. We either call out to Him now or we'll call out to Him later. We will call out in a loving relationship or we will call out in holy terror. Again, it's a choice. Faith is a choice. Let's look at the second thing that Abraham, he was not only called to leave what was familiar, what was comfortable to him, but he also, his faith was greater than the fear of the unknown. It was greater than the fear of the unknown. Look at verse 9. It says, by faith, he, of course, that's Abraham, by faith, Abraham uh, made his home in the promised land like a stranger. I want you to listen to this language, like a stranger in a foreign country. Now listen to the description. He lived in tents, as did Isaac, that's his son, and Jacob, his grandson, who were also heirs again with him of the promise. Just think about that. Think about what he went from and what he went to. You know, when, when we're going on trip, um, how many of you really like just to go by the seat of your pants? You don't like to make plans. You don't like to make reservations. You just know where you're going to go in general, and you just go there. How many like to do that? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Generally speaking, nobody, right? I mean, that is just a really uncomfortable thought. How many of you rather would like to plan your trips out ahead of time? Okay, we're all on that same. Now, I'm what you might call a hyper planner. Uh, I like to plan every detail. Now, I'm going to still leave room for some, you know, some Im impulsive things, that's for sure, but I like to plan. Now, I've taken hundreds of students over hundreds of trips during my two-plus decades of youth ministry in state and out of state. And when I take those kids on that trip, I'm a big fan of planning. In the old days, it was the Rand McNally Atlas. Oh, man, I love my Rand. I went through three or four of those suckers, all right? I wore them out. And I would decide how far I'm going to drive in the first day. And then I would circle the city. I would call. Uh, I would look up the directory. I'd find a preacher in the area. I'd say, hey, listen, I've got uh, 20 people. we got sleeping bags. Do you have a floor we could sleep on? And we'd bed ourselves for the night. I would also plan how much money I was going to need for 15 adults and four or 15 students and four adults and, you know, all of the details, all of the meals, and I would bring cash and, uh, uh, oh, what am I thinking of? The things you signed, uh, uh, traveler's checks. I would get traveler's checks uh, for that trip. And then I would also plan how much space I would need for the luggage, whether I needed two vehicles or I just needed a, a 15 passenger and a trailer to haul all of that stuff. I prepared every aspect of that trip. But I also did that when we were taking family vacations, when we were taking family trips. Now, most often our family vacations were in the scenic town of Belleville, Illinois, uh, right across the river from the St. Louis. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, but it was a free hotel. It was free meals, got to see my family, and there's a lot of things to do in St. Louis. All right, and so we enjoyed our time up there. But in 2001, it was the summer before Mandy, our oldest, was going to be leaving for college, and we decided we were going to take a real vacation, and we went on a three-week vacation. Let me just tell you some of the highlights here. The first night, we stayed on the Chesapeake Bay, watched the sunrise. My kids didn't like that very much. Uh, the next day, then we went to the Naval Academy there in Norfolk and toured the day. We spent three or four days in Washington, D.C. We spent four or five days in New York City. We went to Niagara Falls. We drove into Canada. We went to Cedar Point, the world's greatest place for roller coasters. We were there on Jonathan's 15th birthday and rode roller coasters all day long. And then we finally came back to Illinois to spend time with my family. Now, these pictures I'm going to show you here, these are a couple of the pages of my details of my plans on my trip, all right? I would dot all my I's, I would cross all my T's. Now, again, this is over 20 years old, and yes, I still have it. But what I'm most proud of, or maybe what I should say is what I'm most embarrassed about, is my financial page, all right? My financial page. I estimated every single expense that we would ever have on that trip. Didn't matter if it was the meals or the tolls or the gas or the hotels or the attractions. I did it all. And do you notice my total at the very bottom of the page? Why didn't I just round it off to 4000 even, all right? No, I wasn't going to spend $4,000. I was going to spend $4,043. In fact, I always prided myself. 
<laughs> Man, you're going to think less and less and less of me. Uh, I prided myself in bringing, and I always took cash on vacations. Never spent any, uh, no, never charged, just spent cash. And I prided myself in coming home with the least amount of cash in my wallet as possible. In fact, if I came home from a couple weeks trip with five bucks or less, I knew I planned that trip down to the T. It's great. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what, I w- what I was going to say is no one ever is going to want to take a trip with Kim and myself, but that one's a better, better statement. Yes, I am still married. Now, I-, I say all this to admit to you this. If God had come to me and said, hey, Kent, I, I, I want you to leave the comfort of 1425 6th Street, and I want you to travel to an unknown destination, and I want you to set up a tent there and live, I'm not sure if I'd have the faith to do that. I'm not sure I would have the confidence and the trust to be able to do something that big. Now, you know what? I don't fear the future. Uh, I, I don't even fear death. I know who I am in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know where I'm going. That doesn't concern me. But sometimes I do fear the unknown. And maybe you fear the unknown as well. Uh, Kim and I had a couple little health scares. Uh, her test came back fine. I'm still waiting on one. But I feel, I feel good. I feel fine. Everything's good. Um, and so there's no problems. But there was an unknown for a little bit, and we were concerned about that. Maybe some of you can relate to that in the same way. I also worry about the country I live I fear for the future of America. I know that every single generation will always challenge the generation that has come before. That has always been the case. It always has and it always will. But it feels like the moral fabric of our society has become frayed and is coming apart. And the truth itself as the basis of all things that are right, it's mocked, it's ignored, and sometimes it's completely opposed. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Come, as John says. You know what? Every, uh, every one of us has unknown. In fact, that's because we don't know the future. And sometimes you would like to know the future, but I guarantee you, you don't want to know the future. I think that that was one of the greatest blessings of God is not allowing us to see the future because if you knew what the future was going to hold, it'd freak you out. It'd scare you to death. It really would. It would not be a very good thing. And so God in his mercy says, no, no, you don't need that. Abraham left everything he knew, everything that was comfortable, everything that was familiar, and Abraham went, again, with a full list of unknowns. I mean, when he's moving there, he's like, where am I going to live? And how do I survive this new place? Are there going to be enemies that I have to be concerned about? What about the soil? Because everyone had to plant crops to be able to grow, to be able to survive and live. How will his wife, Sarah, how will she adjust to this change? So many unknowns and so few knowns. And yet, his faith in God was greater than all of the unknowns. He knew that God held him in his hand. In fact, he knew that even the very best plans he had for himself wouldn't be near as good as the plans that God had for him. And so he went. Again, what about us? Do we, have a, do we have a diagnosis with an uncertain future? Trust God with your medical condition. Do we have a child or a grandchild who is very far away from God? Trust your prodigal to the Lord. Do you know that you should speak into a certain situation in your life, but you just fear and you're just not sure that you could say the right thing Trust God, have faith in God for the words that He can give you. Do you need to confess a sin? Do you need to find some accountability for something in your life? Trust God with your secret. Do you need boldness to share your faith with someone who's around you? Then trust God to give you the courage and overcome your fear. Now, let me offer a word of caution as we step out in faith and we say, I'm going to have my faith be greater than the fear of any of the unknowns. When you look here at this chapter, stepping out of faith, like Abraham, does not always lead to the good life. It does not always lead to happiness and sunshines and unicorns and all those things. Look at Abraham, what he did. He goes from a place called Ur where there's great, great wealth and family and friends and is comfortable, and he goes to live in tents. 
for decades, maybe even millennia. He gave up all of those things, becoming vulnerable and even being harassed by those around him. What Abraham came to was not as great as what he left. And so the question is, why did he go? Why did he go? You see, his focus wasn't really on the here and now at all. It wasn't even in the promised land. See, Abraham's faith helped him to, to leave what he was comfortable with, to go to the unknown. And I will guarantee you that it wasn't just about the promised land. It wasn't just about what God said about that. No, Abraham's faith was the third thing. It was focused on the eternal. His faith was focused on the eternal. Look at verse 10 back in Hebrews chapter 11. For he, again, this is Abraham, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. <laughs> Man, I love that verse. That is incredible. Oh, yeah, some of you live in a house that's well-built, it's sturdy, it's great, and you, you, you're thankful for it. Some of you maybe even have helped build a house, and all of those things are great. But Abraham, he had his focus set upon a house that God was going to build, that he would be the architect, he would be the builder of that. And when we build our life upon the rock, it doesn't matter if the winds and waves come, right? Everything's fine. Everything's cool. It reminds me of a great old chorus we've sung in the past, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and then in comparison, the things of this earth, they'll grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I believe that it's a certainty that if Abraham's focus, Abraham's focus was on Ur, if it was on what he was going to have to give up the comforts of life, if his focus would have been on all the unknowns and the fear that those unknowns would have brought, he never would have left, he never would have followed God. And so I ask me first, and then I'll ask you this question. How caught up are you in the world? How deep has the world sunk its talons into your life and your heart and your soul to hold you to the things of this world? Does it have its talons sunk in so deep that you just really can't honestly say, I have faith in God and trust Him at all? See, this, this world is not our home, as the old song says, we're just passing through. But can we sing that? Can we say that with honesty, that I'm not caught up in the things of this world? See, verse 10 makes it very clear that Abraham's focus, his ideas, his, his hopes and dreams were not just upon the promised land, not just the land of Canaan. His hopes and dreams were based upon heaven itself. He anticipated his eternal reward with God himself. Look what 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given to us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into, what's the word? An inheritance, say this with me, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. That's where his focus was. That's what he was anticipating. That's what he was looking forward to. And it's the same inheritance that we have to look forward to as well. It's just like Abraham. It's just like him. His strength was not in himself. His strength was in the Lord. That we don't, again, belong in this world. That this is truly not our home. That we are, are, are aliens and strangers in this place. But when we become God, part of God's family, you realize everything changes. Hear what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, consequently, you are no longer foreigners, and some of the versions say strangers, some of your translations may say aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone. And so the point is this, ordinary people will get distracted a lot. Ordinary people will let the unknowns and the comforts and the things of this earth distract them and their eyes will no longer be focused upon that which is above but it'll be focused on what is below. 
Extraordinary people of faith, though, are able to look past those irritations, problems, even the crisis in life, and they look to what is to come. They see what is on the other side, as Jesus says in Hebrews chapter 12, the joy set before me. Folks, there is joy that comes on the other side of whatever face that you're facing right now. Oh, how quickly I would ask you this, is your focus obscured by the temporary things of this world? How quickly is your focus obscured by the temporary things of this world? Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where vermin and for moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Here's the contrast. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Say this verse because this is the climax, the culmination of this. Say, let's say this together. For where your heart is, there your treasure. Oh, I'm sorry. Say this with me again. Let me say it right. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, Abraham, he was was invested in things above. He was less concerned about the stuff of this world, and he was more concerned with pleasing God. And God had blessed him in material ways. He had a lot of stuff, and it could have distracted him, but his focus was above. As contrary to that, you have King Solomon, who also was blessed by God with great material wealth, And yet Solomon let those things distract him. In fact, Solomon lived a divided loyalty. He had the God that he served, but also the world that he loved as well. And he lived in great sadness and in in, in tears. But Abraham's steady faith led him not only to the promised land, but also led him to life eternal. See, Abraham was willing to, to live by faith. Live by faith that would leave the familiar, that would be greater than all the fear of the unknowns, and would be focused upon eternity. I'll come back to it again. Faith is a choice. It's a choice that you and I make every single day. Abraham. Abraham was an ordinary guy, but he had an extraordinary faith. Abraham, just like us, was sinful, he was broken, he made mistakes, but he made a conscious decision every single day in relationship with God to say, I'll place my faith in you today in this situation, and now I'll do it in this situation, and now I'll do it over here, and now I'll do it over here, so that his life became a life of extraordinary faith. His trust in his faith was incredible. Can we trust God with everything? I think all of us trust God with some things, but can we trust Him with it all? Nothing hold back, held back, that we give it all to Him. See, if and when we seek to control our own lives, to be the masters of our own destiny, to be be the ones who run our own lives, we're not going to only complicate matters, we're going to make a mess of things. But when we turn it over to the Lord and let Him take control... That's when things go very well with us. That's when our ordinary faith becomes an extraordinary faith. So take a a tip from an ordinary guy, just like Abraham, and, and despite all of the fears of the unknowns and the comfort level that you have, turn it over to God and give it to Him. For your... Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the faith of Abraham, who is so very, very clear in his life. He showed showed his way, he showed his faith by, by living a life that was dynamic. And I pray, God, that we can have that same type of faith that would live a life that is an example to others around us. No, we don't want to be worshiped. We're far from that. But we certainly do want to live a faith that is worthy, that's extraordinary, and that other people can say, I want to follow that example. I'd like to do what they're doing. And so God, help us this day to live that out, to be the type of people you want us to be, to give every single thing in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds to you, to not hold anything back. We pray all this in Jesus' name.